Hey everyone, Leslie Rice again, creator and host of The Signal. Just here to thank you all for the magnificent response to episode one. I'm glad you liked our work and hope you'll continue to enjoy our mix of audio drama, horror fiction reading, and nonfiction supernatural tales. We're growing all the time and we're now available on iTunes, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you're looking for a convenient way to get episodes downloaded directly to you the second they're released, a subscription to any of them is the best way to do it. And whichever you use, please be sure to rate and review us. The more ratings we get, the more listeners we attract. If you're looking for other ways to help our show out, we're always welcoming new storytellers on our subreddit, slash r slash signal horror fiction, all one word there. If you're not the greatest writer on the planet, but still want to help out, please consider contributing to our Patreon at patreon.com slash signal obscura. Just $2 a month earns you access to our episodes three days early and other advantages at higher amounts like exclusive bonus episodes, a free mention in the credits, and even free merch once we're making enough. If you don't have the extra, that's okay. Just tell your friends about us and share your experiences with The Signal wherever others might be interested. After all, what's the worst that could happen? This is the signal. Point of origin. Unknown. Destination? Unclear. It carries with it fragments of other places. Other times. Stories from unfathomable pits of darkness. And worlds of unquenchable, all-consuming light. These tales of realities both unimaginably distant and terrifyingly close are woven into, around, and through the signal. Hello, and welcome back to The Signal. Today, we'll be taking a break from our ongoing tale to explore some of the other stories contained within our transmission. In this broadcast, you'll find three tales, one of towering monstrosities and the dark thoughts that drive them, one on the reason why the 5th of November should not and must not be forgotten, and finally, a story exploring the worst type of evil, the kind that many of us are forced to live with every single day. But first, an acknowledgement of one of our earliest listeners, Emma Ross was the second listener to respond to our original test pattern and has been kind enough to lend her support to the signal. When asked what we could do by way of thanks, she declined to answer. However, knowing of her love for Edgar Allan Poe, allow me to offer the following. Take this kiss upon the brow, and in parting from you now, thus much let me avow. You are not wrong who deem that my days have been a dream. Yet if hope has flown away in a night or in a day, in a vision or in none, is it therefore the less gone? All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream. And speaking of dreams, dear listeners, it's now time for us to explore our first story. As the signal makes its way through space and time, it touches upon countless universes, some as small as a single story, others vast beyond imagination and still expanding. The world created by the writing and editing team known as Mailtopia certainly fits into the latter category and encompasses innumerable wonders and terrors. Today, we draw one tale from that pool. Monsters fascinate us. From those small enough to hide even in plain sight, to those so massive as to blot out the sun as they tower above even the tallest skyscraper, we are drawn to them as moths are to a flame. While they can be used to represent many things, from the fear of nuclear destruction to the simple terror of seeing a darting shape from the corner of your eye, there is one nearly universal constant, that they are unknowable, inscrutable, 
and bring out our fear of that which lies beyond the accepted laws of nature. But what if we could know a monster better? What if we could understand its motives, its fears, its desires and longings? Our first story provides us with just such a glimpse. So join us as we explore Meta Devil, a Kaiju's Tale. Like most horrible things, I am man made. When scientists finally broke through the fourth wall of reality into the metaverse, as they called it, they couldn't help but play God yet again. The new handhold on reality gave them an arrogance like nothing before. In short order, the fields of quantum mechanics and general relativity fell away to make room for occult engineering. The new science understood the soul's composition, allowing for its manipulation, augmentation, and perhaps its thorough perversion. The abject science of fallen angels, to be sure. Being a man of society, I was curious and greedy, wanting to keep step with the new age, perhaps exceed it by a stride or two. My standing as a highly decorated military officer allowed me to become a metanaut, one of the few souls brave enough, or stupid enough, to volunteer for a bio-etheric makeover. The scientists, now charmingly referred to as nether mechanics, had just recently discovered how to combine higher dimensional elements with the very fabric of the soul, allowing for the creation of novel and superior forms of life. At least, that's what they believed. Apparently, only a conscious entity's soul was capable of surviving the bonding process, and so a test subject, a guinea pig, was required. I was selected out of thousands of applicants for the procedure. At the end of the day, even the fittest of fools is still no more than a fool. After the proverbial switch was flipped and my body was to become the first ever bioetheric construct, there was an ungodly exchange of alien energies and a subsequent explosion that made the Tunguska blast look like a firecracker. Lucky for the Earth, the blast was confined to outermost space as the experiment took place upon a distant station, far from the most prying eyes. I remember a surging coldness and watching strange lights fall across the face of the void, fireworks to commemorate the end of all things. At some point, I heard the distinct sound of footsteps approaching from below, climbing up a long flight of steps, then, the strangest of all, an enormous whisper, as if a being of unfathomable enormity had placed its lips to my ear. All it said was, what a wicked song you shall make. I awoke in a smoking crater deep within the earth, miles wide. When I stood, my head broke through the black ceiling of roiling clouds that piled from innumerable fires, my shadow plunging the world beneath an avalanche of choking darkness. Turning into the burning light, I beheld myself. I had become a thing of breathless nightmare, all spiraling horns and dripping claws and hooked toothed maws. I had the look of a thing caught between the absurdities of a dragon, man, and devil. From every corner of my body swelled great infusions of biologic armor, cold with the lusterless tinge of grazed iron, yet creaturely in their organic contouring. Lashing, bladed, and barbed tails poured down from my sacral spine. Parts of my skin had distended and thinned, giving me the appearance of wearing the remains of a long, black, tattered cloak that swept from my spiked shoulders, flowing and curling regardless of the wind. Lastly, above my head, a black halo, burning, quiet, and sorrowful. I tried to speak, but only a blast from hell left my mouth. 
splitting the already ruined earth and whipping the billowing smoke into unwholesome shapes. All I wanted was to wake up, to be healed, taken care of. I rushed towards the first signs of civilization I came upon, a large city that emerged in the quivering, heat-distorted distance, and the earth shook and split beneath the incalculable weight of my monstrous gait. I was received by armies. Tanks and jets drew their weapons upon me. Even orbital artillery targeted me from the heavens. Reality seemed to buckle beneath the strain of the moment. A monster from beyond the pale, an eidolon of the impossible standing beneath the revealing rays of the sun in full view. After the strange moment had concluded, the collection of war machines washed me in wave after wave of fire. Yet after each iteration of would-be annihilation, the smoke cleared and I loomed unscathed. At first I fled the attacks, though they could do nothing to harm me. I wanted only to be saved, understood. But each time I begged for help, my voice only injured the world, inciting more violence. This cycle repeated interminably, and my mind began to crack beneath the impossibility of it all. At my wit's end, if not my sanities, I stood my ground against the pursuing hordes of killing machines. Slowly, I began to realize a surge of energy building somewhere both beyond and within me, demanding release. I felt the coil of deathly spirits embrace me, rushing across a great gulf between worlds, a pit of unhallowed depth. It came from my mouth, the power, an annulling requiem for the passing of the world. It blazed the ghostly pale of funeral dreams and howled like cast out angels, tumbling beyond heaven, beautiful and damned. I looked upon the world through my death song, where it fell upon the silenced earth, gray and ashen. Even the light from above turned the color of corpses. My pallid song had killed everything, and within the gathering darkness of the murdered daylight, I disappeared. Only the greatest depths of the sea offered me the chance at anonymity. So I took to exploring its secret reaches with a desperate enthusiasm. Sunken wonders rose to me, unbidden and unapologetic, and I was reminded of that first reality-bending moment when the world first looked upon me. Here were ruined cities, titan and alien, creatures the likes of which no human had ever witnessed. It was like stalking the surface of an alien world, deep beneath a molten sky of endless black. I was privy to the secret wonders of creation, and yet I could share my discoveries with precisely no one. Despite all the power I possessed, the strength that allowed me to overcome all obstacles. It was sheer emptiness that proved the most difficult burden to bear. Thus, it wasn't long before my hopeless quest for salvation became a desperate bid for death. Occasionally, I would emerge from the ocean depths, if only to look upon the sun and a clean blue sky that didn't ripple or shimmer. Mostly, I came ashore to allow men the opportunity to kill me. Necessity is the mother of invention, so they say, and I'd hoped my constant harrowing of their cities might spur the creation of a weapon that would see it done. Despite the many cities I left dying in my wake, despite the thousands of lives I took to fuel man's industry, they failed each and every time to eliminate me. I'd returned to the sea, devastated, yet unscratched. 
It was during one of those meandering attempts at suicide that I caught the strange sight. The city I'd come to harass was already aflame. Its many skyscraping structures smashed, curling tongues of black smoke bleeding into the sky. A broken army of men and machines mangled and scattered. I wandered the burning lanes of the city, pondering the cause of its devastation. Even I'd not destroyed anything so completely. As I carefully eyed the ruins, there appeared a terrible attention and precision worked into the slaughter, a wanton cruelty that went far beyond my casual killing. The destruction itself was wrought by no power I could retrace from the brutal chaos of twisted fused remains of man and metal and concrete and glass. It was as if some sort of cosmic confusion had overtaken the city, allowing one thing intrusion into another, observing neither material nor philosophical boundaries. Yet the placement of the effect suggested a hateful guidance, which implied some level of active intelligence. Despite my finely tuned senses, I could find nothing that continued to draw breath, save for the fires themselves crawling through the streets and buildings, gnawing at the small bits of combustible gristle that still clung to the city's charred bones. After a few moments of fruitless searching, I heard a great commotion from the sky. A massive detachment of heavily armed zeppelins broke through the thick curtains of smoke, their bloated metal bodies reflecting the fires burning below, the wail of gigantic engines propelling them forward. I'd seen their kind before, naturally. Their massive, oversized rail cannons were hard to forget, firing nearly continuously, chewing everything in their path to smoking mulch. Only a few of the floating metal beasts turned their spotlights upon me, exposing me within a bright pyramid of bluish light, their electromagnetic weaponry whirring as it powered up. The remaining gunships pressed their lights to the ground, apparently searching for something else. My curiosity at the vehicle's strange behavior stilled me, as I didn't want to draw their fire until I understood what was happening. It took only a few moments for the cause to reveal itself. An invisible force overtook the Zeppelins, all at once and in spectacular fashion. The craft were drawn together by means of a superior gravity field, crushing them all into the same space, their constricting metal guts hemorrhaging fire and smoke as they compressed further into a single sphere of concentrated death. The screams of metal and men merged similarly sound melting into light, combining with matter, becoming a singularity of soul and steel and fire. The radiant energy of the resulting fusion shone like a star standing upon the earth, its searching light sweeping across the smoldering body of the city, evaporating skin and stone alike. Suddenly the star became a comet, howling down from the heavens straight at me. I didn't even bother to move. My world became the brightest light I'd ever known, and a single deafening note of purest calamity. Unbelievably, I was taken from my feet. Through tenement building after skyscraper, I sailed, towers crashing down in my wake, thunder chasing me across the sky. I came to rest against the cracked stone of a blasted cathedral, the earth still tumbling from the impact fire and smoke outlining the trajectory of my passage, but most importantly I felt the blow. For the first time since my transformation I felt pain. Suddenly I was mortal again, capable of physical suffering, capable of dying. A simple truth dawned upon me. Wanting for death is easy when the price is painless. Anger replaced fear, as the sting of the attack still surged the span of my body. My mounting rage empowered me beyond previous heights, as if my petty self-loathing had retarded my truest calling to become a fully realized monster. 
The transformation of my mind was swift and complete, finally reaching equilibrium with the transmutation of my body. Within moments, I was nearly a whole devil. I rose from the glowing ashes as a new being, my death-lit eyes burning beyond the surrounding conflagration, seeking out my attacker. My sight slithered through the debris, finally alighting upon what seemed the shadow of a mountain peak, frolicking in the thickets of splintered skyscrapers and their smoking foliage. Once the thing realized it had been discovered, it stood stone still, its shape melting out of the deepening night, pouring into a mold of cooling nightmare. Its skull of semi-denuded flesh surmounted a body of weeping, babbling sores. A webbing of sabulous skin stretched taut across its exposed and gleaming muscle tissues. A multitude of corroded spikes secured much of the thing's ruined flesh to its demonic scaffolding of twisted, smoking bones. Tangles of eel-like shapes swung from the back of the monster's head, a topknot of clutching tubers, each one terminating in a ravenous mouth, overfilled with gnashing and bleeding teeth. Most horridly, a collection of steel pikes played across its shoulders and down the curve of its back. Like a forest of metal trees, hundreds of hapless men and women impaled, moaning and screaming upon them. I had no doubt about the origin of the creature, a thing called up from beyond the known universe by those witches of science, their unending quest to own the power of nature having invited another abomination. This thing, however, clearly partook from no share of human stock. We paused for some time, contemplating the mystery of the other. Unexpectedly, its mouth opened with the crackle of snapping cartilage and the tearing of tender flesh. Its voice was the sum of countless painful screams, and I could feel the invisible touch of innumerable blades and hooks trying to work the flesh from my bones. The time had come for me to fight for my life rather than my death. I decided to match fire with fire, and so I set free my own voice. For the first time since my transformation, my intentions were fully conveyed through the means of my lethal speech. The death song poured from my hellish mouth, lashing the creature and the surrounding world with its annihilating light. The terrible starkness of it glowed paler and bleaker by the moment, further submerging the monster into my frothing aria, its collective scream becoming exclusively its own. Had my mouth been made for smiling rather than devouring and death singing, I might have grinned when my enemy clutched its head and collapsed into the pile of blowing debris I'd made of its surroundings. Yet I did not relent. I filled my bloodless fist with death light, and using it as a tuning fork, I channeled the burning light of my refrain to an arcing note of purest death. It seared into the soul of the monster, setting its spirit ablaze with obliterating song. The creature writhed in the ashes, the weeping swords covering its body, now screeching and howling. Slowly, the demon outstretched a bony limb and gestured to me. It felt as if a great hand had taken all of me into its grip and proceeded to squeeze. The mounting force was incredible, causing nearby structures to tumble towards me as if I'd become the center of all gravity. Before long, the entire world was falling on me. Huge swaths of the earth broke free from the ground and smashed into me, along with the nearby buildings and vehicles, trees and bridges. A crushing tomb of fused wreckage locked me away from the outside world, and I could feel my very soul coming under the pull of invisible forces. I detected a hidden rhythm within the crushing energy, a whispered secret built into the bones of its being. 
and I sang to that rhythm. I seized its essence in an awful grip of my own, a soul-destroying serenade scored from the bane of its mystery. The death light began evaporating my prison, and soon my blinding song became the world. I exited the great tomb as if hatching from a blazing egg. The monster retreated from the swelling corona of my song, fleeing the light of death, offering yet another opportunity for me to strike. Despite the primitivism of my impulse, I desired a more direct approach to the destruction of my foe. I launched across the broken battleground and laid my fist into the monster's exposed skull, creating thunder and sending the beast on his own journey through the devastated city. My billowing cloak of flowing flesh caught the soaring thermals from a million fires and it began to rise from the ground, my killing sounds rending a path through ground gravity and space. From the blackened sky, I could see the settling chaos of the monster's travels, where it finally reposed in pain and fire and smoke. It began to beckon the shadows, wrapping them around itself, hoping to vanish from sight. Crooning in a voice I'd never known, I was absorbed into my own song, becoming an immaterial composition of palest death and destruction. I filled the sky like a storm, raining cold notes from the grave upon my prone opponent, replacing thunder with rattling chords, exchanging lightning for death light. At last, I crashed down upon the outsider, a spiraling crescendo of light and sound. The monster's body exploded into curving streams of boiling black blood and flecks of cartilage and flaking bone. Before the creature's soul could depart the earth, I enveloped it within a gentle requiem, recreating its unclean spirit as a single note within my poisonous chorus. But I did not stop at the creature. I wanted to test my strength. I continued into the earth, beneath the remains of the monster, singing the apocalypse. I could taste the end of all things, filling the mouth of my widening dirge. I'd only to swallow, and it would all be over. At some point, I calmed my voice and drew myself whole again from the wheeling song I had become. I was astonished by what I'd done. The city was gone completely. Just the gray echoes of ash and smoke recalled the solidity of the vanished city. And yet, beyond the smoke, falling back in near-infinite lines of tank and soldier and zeppelin. From the banks of my destruction stood a sprawling army of men. They had come for the final battle. They seemed perched upon the very brink of attack, but held their fire until they knew I'd fully committed to the war to end all wars. Fear became the air they breathed and I could hear countless hearts beating out a dissonance of darkest expectation. Yet I knew this wasn't the end. The universe concealed more monsters and catastrophes to come. My place in all of this was up to me, and I'd grown tired of chasing death. I walked to the edge of the gathered legions and waited creating a massive path leading out to the sea, the armies parted. I walked among the warriors and their weapons of destruction, my great tread, the crackling fires, and the billow of my cloak the only sounds. When I reached the edge of the sea, I did not glance back, but only took my place within its depths. Whether I returned as destroyer or savior, was a choice I would leave to man.
monstrousness isn't necessarily determined by our physical form. Indeed, it's our actions that make us truly worthy to be called human, or which condemn us as being far, far less. In our next story, written by Stephen D. Jackson and narrated by Damien Girard, a group of young boys prepare to celebrate a holiday dedicated to a man that straddled the line between man and monster, and who falls easily into either category depending on the perspective of the observer. Regardless of their status as good or evil, some actions echo into eternity, and that is why it's time to remember, remember the 5th of November. And if you don't get that reference, don't worry. It's a guy thing. I haven't been to a bonfire since I was 12 years old. For the last 18 years I've avoided them, stayed late at work on bonfire night, squeezed my eyes tight at the sounds of fireworks. All because of what happened that night all those years ago. I still hear the screaming of my friends, see the jerking movement of shadowy figures between flickers of dancing firelight. We had no idea how specific the rules were. We figured it was just a bit of fun. Stuff a few old clothes with straw, make a passable effigy of a person and call it the guy. Shove him on the fire and watch him burn. Now I think about it, the whole thing couldn't fail to have a dark and twisted background, could it? More so than the treason thing, I mean. Everyone knows the story. Guy Fawkes wanted to bring down the Protestant king and his government in order to restore the monarchy to the Catholics who paid for and organised his attempt. Some people, wrongly, think of Guy Fawkes as some kind of freedom fighter anarchist, much like they think of Che Guevara, the squalid killer and totalitarian tyrant, as an idealist for social equality. But that's their choice. After all, ignorance is bliss, and the truth of it is probably lost to the mists of time. It hardly matters. The only truth that really matters is the one that plays out every November the 5th. I didn't find out the truth for many years after it happened, but now I understand. I've been working in local government, a very specific department of local government, for many years now in a position open only to a few. Open only to people who have seen the things I've seen, and that's how I know what I need to tell you. So I'll tell you what happened to me first, because it's the same thing that could happen to you, to anyone, to your kids, after they tell you they're doing one thing and actually do something completely different. I'm not saying you need to watch them 24-7, but I am saying you need to watch them on the night of November the 4th. My parents knew we were having a sleepover at Thomas' house. They just had no idea his parents were away. How could they have known? I was pretty adept at lying through my teeth about such things at that age. In any case, we snuck out at about 11.30pm, which to us was ridiculously late, and set about making our own bonfire. Our guy was made from Tommy's clothes. There had been a vote of sorts, and he'd lost. We figured his parents wouldn't notice his stuff missing because he had the most clothes. <laughs> Kid logic, I guess. The straw had been taken from the bales up on the fields behind the houses, and we enthusiastically stuffed the old jeans and jumper with straw and tied the two bits together with string. We stuck a large stick through his neck so it protruded out, and the sack filled with yet more straw was then shoved ceremoniously onto the stick as his head. We thought it was brilliant. A life-size guy, all of our own. Before long, the fire was blazing, and we started to worry that it was too big. Although we were pretty far from the town, through the woods and up on the fields, we wondered if people would spot us. Specifically, our parents. We were too young to think seriously about the police or fire brigade, or anyone else for that matter. And now I think of it, 
I am astounded that no one came to investigate the fire. That must have been like a beacon in that dark night, even through the woods. I had no idea that what we were doing was deeply, deeply dangerous. And not just because of the flames and the stupidity of being a 12 year old far from home on a dark night. I warn you, the next part of this is not pleasant, but I must tell you anyway. I am not likely to be allowed to live having disclosed this truth, but disclose it I must for your sake. Tommy and Ross were making the final adjustments to the guy, fiddling with the cheap shoes that wouldn't stay on the straw sticking out of the jeans and trying to fit the gloves at the end of the arm. I was standing a little further back, gazing in rapt awe at the leaping tons of flame lapping the dry wood we'd piled up. I remember the cracking of old sticks, the showers of pretty embers as larger logs split apart, glowing briefly against the black grass. Shadows flickered all around us. And then the screaming started. I turned to Ross's first panicked cry and froze at the sight. The glove he'd been struggling with had his wrist in a vice-like grip, and Tommy was staggering back, clutching his nose, reeling away from the straw man's leg, which had clearly just kicked him. Blood showed between his fingers, and for a moment I was transfixed by the sight, before my eyes were torn away by the terrified cry Ross made as the guy took hold of his other arm and hurled him into the flames. The scream he uttered was something that stayed with me my entire life. A howl of desperate, disbelieving horror and agony, like the squeal of a petrified animal, and then lost in the crack of the flames. I only just managed to snatch Tommy out of reach as the gloved hand grabbed at him, and I dragged him back as the lurching nightmare lumbered forward on unsteady legs. It was its silence that nearly cost me my life. That implacably relentless malice, so unlike any threat I could have imagined with my childlike brain, that it nearly rooted me to the spot with unfocused, confused terror. I hadn't even had time to process what had happened to Ross, and I think the screaming in my ears was my own. The creature took another staggering step, its misshapen, filthy bag head wobbling unsteadily on its pole its arms swinging as though ready to fall off. Tommy ran at it, tears streaming down his blood-spattered face, and shoved it hard in the chest, trying to push it into the fire. He was screaming too. The thing was knocked back, its arms flailing, but it didn't fall into the flames. Instead, it snatched at Tommy's hand, pulling him down with it. Tommy fell on the other side of it, so that the writhing straw man's back blocked him from sight as it rolled over. I tried to move, to answer Tommy's ghastly screams for help, but I couldn't. I was motionless, impotent with fear. Tommy's screams became gurgles as the thing made odd, frantic movements with its arm, which I realised with a hideous, dawning horror were the motions of a man stuffing a guy with straw. Somehow at that moment my mind cleared and I ran forward and saw what was happening to my friend. But the sight has never left me. Tommy, lying by the fire, his hair catching a light, his eyes staring, unseeing at the stars overhead. Orange light and black shadows playing over his dead face, his features frozen in a look of unutterable horror. And the straw demon, forcing more and more straw into his chest cavity, not caring that my friend was already gone. Again and again, its gloved hand had thrust more straw inside him, as though oblivious to all else. I don't know what I was thinking. All rational thought had long since gone from me. But from somewhere far away, I saw myself dive at the monster, yelling in that primal, terrified way humans have always yelled when fighting a last stand against a superior foe. But the thing was unbalanced, hunched as it was over the body of my friend. It was unable to steady itself, and it fell easily to the side, knocking into the hungry fire. It was instantly ablaze. The old straw burst into flame with an almost impossible speed, the bright light and heat consuming it within moments. I stepped back, watching in grim horror as the thing writhed and danced, flailing uselessly at its tormentor before collapsing, lying like just another guy burning on a bonfire. I turned and fled. I'm not proud of that. 
I left Tommy and Ross up there and I didn't look back. I spent the night outside Tommy's house because I didn't have keys. In the morning, my parents found me, sitting motionless by the front door, my arms around my knees. I managed to garble out what had happened, and from that, they and the police figured we'd been attacked by someone or something. They didn't believe the story, as I told them, of course. I put most of it down to the child's shock. The remains of the bonfire were searched, but no signs of the found of Tommy or Ross. Somehow or other, the news of my story eventually found its way to the ears of the innocently named Department for Fire Safety at the local council. It's their job to make sure such things don't happen, and before long I've been inducted into their ranks. That's where I learned the truth, and was forbidden to tell it. But tell it I will, if only to keep you safe, or possibly to get my own back a little. I have no love for my erstwhile employers, as you've probably deduced from all this and I don't agree with their methods. The point is, the first guy of the year, the first one completed on November the 5th, contains the restless and tortured spirit of the man himself, Forks, condemned eternally to return and be punished over and over and over again. It's ghastly, it's horrific, but that's just how it is. I'm so used to it now, the story doesn't affect me anymore which I suppose is part of the reason I hate my job, for what it's done to me. Anyway, the church has always known, and back in the old days, firewood was hard enough to come by as it was, so no one built their own bonfires. It was all controlled by the churches, and they largely made sure people were safe, and the punishment went on and on, year after dreadful year. But as times changed, the secular authorities, like the one I work for, took over, and the job became less about keeping people safe, more about keeping the awful truth a secret. We make sure the first guy built on November the 5th is made by people who knew what they're doing, in a controlled environment, and that when he returns, he burns quickly without taking anyone with him. After all, he does not return to the flames without a fight, as Tommy and Ross learned to their tragic detriment. Unfortunately for us, we built our guys shortly after midnight on 5th of November, in a spot, coincidentally, between the council patrols. No one stopped us finishing that effigy. No one checked with the lab whether it was safe. It sometimes happens, and the clean-up operation is usually a logistical and public relations nightmare, with a focus almost entirely on hushing it up. I can't stand it anymore. The witness relocation programs, the hush money, the 24-7 surveillance of survivors, it's wrong. I think people would rather be trusted to face the issue themselves. So now you know. Remember, remember. The 5th of November. It's true that some punishments can last an eternity. But others? They only seem to. An annoying co-worker. A noisy neighbor a spat with the girlfriend, or even a spot of mold on the wallpaper. Any of these are enough to sour your day, but at what point does simple bad luck and circumstance become something more malicious? At what point is someone forced to ask themselves if they're being targeted? At what point does such a paranoid fantasy become all too real? While these answers may vary from person to person, our next story, from Raphael Marmol, offers us the answer for one very unlucky man, whose tale is only known when those who come after discover the journal in storage unit number 25. When the lock on unit number 25 was broken, the other bidders groaned and rolled their eyes, knowing it was a waste of time. The auctioneer rolled his eyes and simply went through the motions of attempting to sell the unit. Rules were rules, he couldn't skip it. As soon as the gate was lifted, the stench of moisture, soil, and musk assaulted our noses. From the look of it, there was nothing of value for flipping. There was no reason for me to bid on it, yet for some reason I still cannot even explain I did. At first, I dismissed it outright like the rest of them and waited. 
The auctioneer started the bids at $200 to the chuckles and murmurs of the crowd. The asking price plummeted to $50 after a minute of the auctioneer's rapid-fire offers. The inactivity broke at the $25 mark when a gentleman lifted his hand into the air. As the auctioneer began to count, this overwhelming certainty that there was something valuable inside the unit hit me. It was so strange. On the second count, I outbid the man. He smirked with a shrug and bowed out of the bidding. At the count of three, unit number 25 was mine, and I've regretted it ever since. Unit number 25 never strayed far from my thoughts. The other units had no appeal despite showing promising inventory to flip on eBay or Craigslist. There was an itch to get inside the unit, and it would drive me insane until it was scratched. When the rest of the auctions finished and it came time to pay, I practically threw the money at the cashier and ran back to the unit. Lifting the orange gate felt like scratching around the area of an itch, but not quite getting to the offending spot. In terms of monetary value, Unit 25 was a success. A Panasonic plasma television with an accompanying home theater system was hidden behind an old beige-colored couch covered in dark brown stains. Those ensured my gamble paid off in spades. There were more valuables too, but I won't get into them. The majority of the unit was junk, though. Pieces of a broken coffee table, a mattress covered in yellow sweat stains, at least I hope they were sweat stains, and a bunch of other trinkets littered the unit. The drawers of an old desk called out to me like a beacon in a lighthouse. The certainty of something being in there nagged me again. The drawer creaked open, and inside was a bound leather book. It seemed to glow against the dim light in the unit. Sliding off the leather tie holding it shut, I felt a warmth flow through me from head to toe. It felt like bathing in a pool of freshly baked brownies. The single bulb lighting the unit brightened, like tossing a log into a fire. My vision blurred. I stumbled over, feeling faint all of a sudden, and dropped the journal on the floor to catch myself on the desk. Taking a precaution against passing out, I slid to the cold and dusty floor. The journal sat open on the floor next to me, and it opened to a page and a few of the words caught my attention. Flipping through the pages back to the first entry, I began to read the following. Journal Entry 1 Mrs. Wiselink lectured me today about being loud and annoying to the other people around me. She went on this crazy tirade about hearing me arguing with someone last night. I wasn't home last night, is what I would have said if I managed to sneak a sentence in between her endless rant. As soon as I started talking, she'd interrupt me, complaining about slamming doors and loud laughter echoing down the hallways from my apartment at all hours of the night. When I was finally able to tell her that I had slept at Brandy's apartment, the old hag frowned at me with that wrinkled old face of hers and shook her head. That's when she really lost her shit. She called me a smelly liar and warned me that if I didn't keep everything quiet and orderly, that my ass would be on the street. I stated once again it wasn't me and suggested she have a talk with the people in the apartment next to mine. Her brow furrowed and she looked confused. Without another word, the old woman snatched the rent check from my hand and slammed the door in my face. Keep it quiet and orderly, right? I wanted to shout through the door. There was one more issue I wanted to discuss, but she hadn't given me a chance. She had promised to call someone in to cover up the weird spot on my wall. I don't know if it's mold or fungus, but it keeps getting bigger. My theory is there's a small leak behind the wall, and the wet wallpaper is scrunching up into it. I don't know. Going through the trouble of getting her back to the door wasn't worth it. She'd probably try to start up trouble with me over it, since she's got nothing better to do in her life than train her cat to piss in the toilet. Can't wait to leave this shithole and move in with Brandy. Oh, and on the walk back to my apartment, I heard the next door neighbors laughing it up through their apartment door. With these paper-thin walls, it was like having a never-ending party hosted in my apartment. I don't know how many people live there. Definitely not all of them are on the lease. They're constantly laughing, yelling, and talking to each other. I'm not even sure if they're speaking English half the time. I can't understand them. It's really irritating. I've knocked on their door a few times, but they never answer. I slip notes under their door only to have them return to me. The nights where it is especially bad, I've banged on their walls and shouted for them to keep it down. 
Sometimes they comply. Most of the time, all I get from my troubles is more jeering laughter. I can't wait to leave this shithole behind, counting down the days until the lease is done. Journal Entry 2 Today was the day from hell. This morning, I couldn't find my house keys or cell phone. I had to lock myself out of my house and ask Wiseling to let me in later. She was the last person I wanted to speak with, but I couldn't leave my apartment door open. I hoped to God she'd be awake when I got off my shift. Even if she wasn't awake, the crone had nothing to do the next morning, so she could sleep in. When I got to work, Warnett was standing right at the front of the door, smoking a cigarette and looking at his watch. I was half an hour late. When I tried to apologize and explain to him what happened, he waved me off with the disapproving eye roll I've become accustomed to seeing from him lately. My sales numbers have plummeted the past two months, and Warnett was on the warpath about it. If it wasn't bad enough, every customer I tried to assist today seemed to be having a worse day than I was. Each person was more annoyed with me than the last. My best efforts to be friendly with them were met with even worse treatment. I considered the possibility that I was being pranked at one point. The tip of the iceberg was this old guy that was looking for a GPS upgrade card. Somehow I just knew this one was going to be the worst. I told him in the nicest way possible, Sir, your GPS doesn't require an upgrade card. The old man exploded. He went from kindly old man to a purple-faced irate berserker in less than a second. This sneer twisted into his face and his eyes bulged from their sockets like they were going to pop out of his skull. He bared his teeth at me like some rabid animal about to attack. He berated me on the floor, drawing the attention of everyone in the entire store. For a second, I thought he was going to try and kill me. How dare you try to deceive me, you smelly little shit? Get me a fucking manager right now. Warnet comes dashing over and screams for me to go into the break room, then attends to the old man. My face was burning with embarrassment. I was more than happy to walk off the sales floor, away from all the prying eyes of every employee and customer in the building. A few minutes later, Warren had charged into the break room to take his turn berating me, too. <laughs> the old man told Warren I had given him an attitude and lied to him about the GPS upgrade card. Then, instead of trying to further assist him, I pointed him in the direction of the automotive department and told him to find it himself. Warnett didn't even give me a chance to refute the old man's lies. He banished me into the warehouse, informing me that I was going to receive a disciplinary write-up. This, in combination with my sales numbers, was grounds for termination. It was complete and utter horseshit, and I couldn't do a damn thing about it. At the end of my shift, two of my coworkers told me they had received some telephone calls from me in the middle of the night. I told them my phone had been misplaced, and it couldn't have been me. Maybe someone was reaching out to them to return it, or maybe they had bad service. They both said that no one spoke on the other end of the line, both calls ended abruptly with a loud, high-pitched scream and then silence. They tried to call back, and it would go straight to voicemail. I apologized and promised to take care of the problem. I called Verizon right away and asked customer service to disconnect the phone. They stuck me with some ridiculous fees, which I was forced to agree to in order to shut the phone line down. Warnett then comes into the office and sees me on the phone. He looks like he's about to lose it. He tells me he needs me to stay until closing. I agreed to the shift to avoid pissing him off any further. With a 12-hour shift ahead of me, I asked if I could take half an hour break to get dinner, and Warren responded, You think you deserve more time off the clock than you've already taken today? Unfucking believable You were late this morning. You royally pissed off that old man, too. You've used up all your breaks for today. The asshole turned around, leaving through the double doors back onto the sales floor. I didn't sell today. <laughs> My dollars per hour generated were fucked, and I'd stayed until 11 o'clock at night. Starving and feeling like shit, the last thing I wanted to deal with was asking Mrs. Wisling to let me inside my own apartment. I'm falling asleep right now, but I'll say knocking on her door and asking her to help me went about as pleasant as having someone kick me in the balls with a steel-toed boot half a dozen times. I need a new apartment, I need a new job, I need a new life. Fuck all this shit. Journal Entry 3 Murphy's Law is a 
bitch. Someone broke into my apartment. <laughs> Everything not bolted to the ground was broken into pieces and tossed around the apartment. <laughs> Unless Spider-Man decided to turn to a life of breaking and entering, there was no way someone could have come in through the window. There were no signs of forced entry, at least none that I could find. Nothing was stolen either. Everything was just demolished. With my phone still missing, I couldn't call the police. It hasn't turned up anywhere, and Verizon still hasn't deactivated it yet. Most of my coworkers were getting phone calls now. That's another whole bag of shit I'm dealing with, though. I bolted over to the apartment next door and knocked. No one answered, despite hearing their roaring laughter in the hallway before I opened the door to my ransacked apartment. After five minutes of knocking and shouting it was an emergency, I gave up on them. Forced to ask Wiseling to use her phone, I knocked on her door, and the hallway filled with their laughter again. What a bunch of dicks. Mrs. Wiseling answered the door with the same sour look on her face from the last time she slammed the door in my face at 11.30 p.m. on the night I locked myself out. I told her about my situation and asked if I could use her phone. <laughs> the bitch actually seemed conflicted about it. I mean, for God's sake, she may not like me for whatever reason, but a phone call to the police isn't any skin off of her back. She let me in after literally having to get on my hands and knees to beg to use the phone. I'll never forget the smell of cat piss, musk, and cooking spices permeating the apartment. Breathing through my mouth was the only saving grace I had while speaking with the dispatcher. They said someone would be over immediately. It was the first time in days someone had actually treated me like a human being. I nearly teared up at the display of basic human kindness. After hanging up, I turned to thank the old lady and was rewarded with the urge to vomit instead. She had sat down in a chair and spread eagle with no underwear on. What made it worse was that she was in the middle of taking her teeth out of her mouth and putting them into a glass of water. Thank you, I shouted and ran out of there fast. When the officers arrived, they seemed bothered to be there. They didn't care about anything I said beyond getting the information they needed to fill out their paperwork. Both of them kept clearing their throats and making these sour looking faces as if they smelled something bad in the air. Mrs. Wiselink made it worse by coming into my apartment. She gasped and began howling about the carpet being filthy. I had no idea what she was talking about until I took a look over her shoulder and saw a path of brown footprints smeared from the door leading across the living room carpet to my couch, then up the wall to where the spot on the wall had been. The damn thing had only gotten bigger. It wasn't going to be my problem once I left, so I didn't even bother chasing the old bitch around trying to get it fixed. They hadn't been there when I first came in. It made no sense. In the time I had been out, someone must have snuck back inside. Instinct told me it was the neighbors, since they were the only ones around. They had broken in. It was the only explanation. My thoughts were interrupted by Mrs. Wiselinks insisting I pay for new carpet since I was too stupid to lock my doors before I went out. Lucky for her, the policemen were there, otherwise I may have strangled her. We looked over the apartment and nothing was missing. Wiselink looked inside from the doorway and scoffed at me. She huffed and puffed so much about the muddy carpets, I considered actually punching her in the face. The police officers finished their report and looked happy to leave the apartment to ask the neighbors if anyone had heard anything. Most of the other tenants in the building weren't home during the day. The ones who were home said they hadn't heard anything. They knocked on my neighbor's door and no one answered. This is where shit got weird. Wiseling told them not to bother knocking since no one lived there. Lady, are you fucking senile? Burst out of my mouth in an instant. All eyes turned to me once again. Wiselink looked like she was about to have a stroke. The officers looked at me like someone looked at dog shit they just stepped in. It was like work all over again. I apologized right away and told them it was the stress. One of the officers coldly asked me to sign my statement and left without an additional word. Wiselink stood at the door, shook her head, and said something under her breath before leaving. I could have sworn it was the word psycho. 
I shut the door as they left, then slumped against the door, slowly letting myself fall to the ground and bawled my eyes out. Once I stopped sobbing, I dragged myself over to the refrigerator for a beer. The craving to have one was so bad I could taste it. When I pulled the door open, the hinges moaned, and the door crashed to the floor. A disaster of beer, food, and condiments mixed with glass covered the floor. There was nothing else to do but laugh. The neighbors thought it was okay to join me. I wanted to slam my fist into the walls and tell them to shut up, but I didn't have the energy. Suddenly, a scream rang out on their side. It was unintelligible, but no one made a sound after. I welcomed the silence, but I couldn't stand to be there for one more minute. The safety of my home was compromised. There was no comfort in staying here anymore. Brandy was my only option. She was surprised to see me when I showed up at her apartment. She looked very well put together like she was about to go out on a date or something. I asked if she had any plans for the night and explained the situation to her. She said she was going to see some friends for dinner, but she could cancel. I could tell she was annoyed, but I didn't have the energy to apologize any more than I already had. I told her to go out, but she canceled on them and stayed with me for the night. It took a long time for me to fall asleep. Each time I closed my eyes, images of my ruined apartment flashed before me. I muffled my cries with a pillow so I wouldn't wake Brandy. I really fucking hate my life. Journal Entry 4 I'm so happy to be back in my apartment. If I had to stay with Brandy another day, I think I would have choked her to death in her sleep. It's perplexing because everything started off so nicely between us. We awoke together, made breakfast, went to work, and came home to each other's company. After the second day, things got weird. Brandy would get annoyed with me for no reason and start fights. She even complained I smelled like rancid milk or something fucking juvenile like that. I'd try to defuse the situation, but she would lay into me with whatever was on her mind. By the time I left her place, my desire to be with her was gone. We'll be breaking up soon. This whole experience opened my eyes to who she really was. I don't want to be with someone who treats their significant other as badly as she treated me. I couldn't take the abuse anymore and came back here despite feeling unsafe. As soon as I opened the door, the smell of rancid pickles, old beer, and olive juice stung my nostrils. My first order of business was to clean the place up. It took almost an entire day to get it back into tolerable conditions. The only good news to report so far is my renter's insurance covered a good portion of the broken items. Strangely, the whole process went without a hitch. The gentleman on the phone was pleasant and helpful, nothing like Verizon. All I needed to do was take an inventory of what was broken, send him a copy of the police report, and wait for a check to arrive in the mail. It was nice to finally have someone treating me like a person again. The only issue needing to be resolved was my cell phone. It was still connected somehow. After being reassured several times, it was turned off by Verizon. The complaints at work about me calling everyone were getting out of hand. No one gave me the benefit of the doubt anymore. Everybody seemed incredibly hostile to me and even confronted me about the horrible threats I'd made against them. I flipped the fuck out on a couple of customer service reps for lying to me. They passed me to a manager who treated me kindly and assured me they were going to resolve the situation. He even offered to credit my account for the two weeks my phone had still been activated. Even though the manager was nice, someone needed to be held responsible and face the consequences of their ineptitude. The only thing the manager could say was the phone was disconnected from use the first day I reported it. I calmly reassured him if one more person tells me about obscene phone calls coming from my number, I would fly to India or wherever godforsaken shithole he lived in and murder his entire family in front of him. He cursed me in whatever gibberish language he spoke and hung up the phone. The neighbors are still at it. I thought about calling the police on them, but reconsidered seeing how those pig shits treated me the last time. Those fuckers never sleep. Banging on the walls and yelling at them to shut their traps doesn't work. One of these days, 
I'm going to get a sledgehammer and break down the wall between us so they have no place to go. I'll hit it right in the middle of the stupid fucking spot on the wall. I can't miss it now. It's huge. Wise Link is going to take my entire deposit. Maybe the sledgehammer will change her mind when the time comes. I've knocked on the neighbor's door and they don't answer. I challenge them to come out and fight me. I feel their eyes on me through the people. They giggle behind the door. All the gods in human history won't be able to save them if I ever catch them outside the apartment. Now that I think about it, I wouldn't know what they looked like even if I did see them. I've never seen their faces. They could walk right by me on the street and I wouldn't know. They knew who I was. We could be in the same elevator, street, or walkways, and I'd be the schmuck not knowing it was them. They could come home and tell their little friends about the idiot next door not knowing. The thought simultaneously pissed me off and freaked me out. Work is intolerable. My co-workers seem to be actively avoiding me. I've caught a few of the girls spraying perfume into the air in places where I had been standing or in the break room after I leave. Customers aren't approaching me for help either. I get paid regardless of my sales, so it's fine by me. Warren has been on my case about my numbers. Same shit, different day. Fuck um all. Journal entry five. I got fired today. Warnet canned me for threatening and harassing my co-workers over the phone. I explained it to the overpaid, self-righteous asshole in the most simplest of words. I didn't have a phone with which to make those calls. Hence, I am not at fault. He turned to his computer and clicked the mouse twice. My voice came out of the speakers of his computer. In the shock of the moment, I didn't really pay attention to what my voice actually said. It wasn't important anyway. I know the word cunt was said a lot. One particular part sticks out where I threatened to titty fuck a co-worker until my cock could penetrate her heart through her rib cage if she didn't stop spraying me with perfume. Otherwise, I don't remember exactly what was said. What I do remember was Actually, in the background of the recording, there was laughter, hooting, and hollering with each vile word spewed from my mouth. The recording finished with a high-pitched shriek, and the line went dead. Warnett's voice pulled me from the shock and the utter insanity of the situation. He droned on about how the recordings had been forwarded to human resources after several employees came forward with more recordings and refused to come to work if I was still allowed inside the building. He said I should be thankful they weren't going to get the police involved as if he was doing me some sort of favor. It was human resources and corporate avoiding the additional paperwork and the possibility of litigation. Everyone was probably convinced not to press charges against me. Warnett handed me a termination notice with a shit-eating grin plastered across his acne-cratered face. I've never seen a man jump as high as he did when my fist slammed against his desk. It sort of scared me, too. <laughs> he tensed up and went quiet. The grin was replaced with wide-eyed fear. Holding the arms of my chair in a vice-like grip stopped me from reaching over the table and throwing a stapler into his face. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't think. Everything was black and red. The words coming from my mouth didn't feel like mine. There was this disdain and malice in them. My stomach turned. I felt disgusting. Each syllable was like fecal matter and pus. I told him to expect human services to take a closer look at his management decisions. Egregious amounts of time were spent outside smoking with his employees. Time theft was a very serious offense to my former employer. Corporate didn't take kindly to wasted time. 
There was also the matter of his infamous out-of-the-box deals going to his best customers, who also were related to him. The percentage off an item was equivalent to stealing. There was also a recent hire receiving a promotion over veteran employees. The appropriateness of their relationship outside of work may have had something to do with the promotion. Warnett's face was like a cooked lobster. He didn't even respond. He picked up the phone and had our loss prevention department escort me out of the building. As they tossed me out of the building, a laugh escaped my throat. It rolled like a cartoon snowball down a hill into a full-blown laughing fit. I cursed at the customers and former co-workers staring at me. I told them they needed to take their business elsewhere since this company hires smelly, crazy people who harass and threaten their co-workers. I don't have a job anymore. It feels fucking great. Journal entry six. This isn't a complaint in the slightest, but I've been on a short fuse lately. Everyone gives me shit all the time, and I stand by taking it like a bitch. Those days are done and over. I'm nobody's doormat. Nobody walks on me anymore. No one crosses me, or they'll discover the consequences of their actions. Too many people for far too long have treated me like nothing. It stops here and now. Mrs. Wiselink learned her lesson today. I paid the old crotch cunt her rent money. There was fear in her eyes. A big old fake smile was plastered on her face. She was trying not to breathe. I asked if she smelled something funny. She shook her head no. I demanded she evict the neighbors because I was going to strangle them to death with their intestines if she didn't. She smiled and nodded at me while closing her door. She didn't slam it in my face again. I'd have throttled her if she did. I could tell she was afraid of me. I liked it a lot. Journal Entry 7 Brandy showed up today for the infamous talk. She wanted to end our relationship, saying I was the one who changed into a different person. My blood boiled worse than when I fought with Warnet. She started all the fights. She was the one who had changed for the worse. It was her fault. I didn't want to be around her. She knew her reasoning was bullshit. In the final moments of our relationship, she confirmed at the top of her lungs that she'd been fucking several other guys while she'd been with me. The reaction from the neighbors was mixed. Half of them laughed hysterically, the other half booed and jeered. Her onslaught of insults didn't stop there. She called me a pathetic excuse for a man. Everyone could walk all over me. I never stood up for myself. Shit like that. The neighbors hooted and hollered like never before. They were getting a huge kick out of all of it. Then everything went red. My memory of what happened is hazy at best. A table lamp found itself in my hand. I flung it at the wall. Brandy dodged it before it shattered against the wall right behind her. If she hadn't ducked in time, it would have nailed her right in her slut face. The neighbors hollered. The spot on the wall seemed to ripple, like a pond. I don't think she heard them. She didn't see the spot. Brandy rose from the ground with her hands held in front of her in surrender, then scrambled out the front door. Her cries drowned out with righteous applause from the neighbors. The apartment shook. Everything went silent after. The only sound I heard was the air conditioner in the background. Then there was a single ha-ha from next door. The next 20 minutes were spent throwing everything in my apartment against the spot on the wall. When there was nothing left, kicks and punches sufficed. Nothing in the world was going to keep me from getting inside their apartment and killing them all except collapsing onto the floor in a heap of misery and exhaustion. I shouldn't have done that. 
I felt like I needed to apologize to Brandy for throwing the lamp at her. I wanted to tell her how sorry I was. Vomit rose in the back of my throat. My thoughts aren't mine. I'm not like this at all. And he was right. I'm not me anymore. Journal Entry 8 This heat is unbearable. The fever is much worse. Nothing helps break it. <laughs> Haven't slept in days. Insane nightmares. I'm a sweat pool. I don't remember anything about dreaming. Hushed voices whisper to each other. It feels like there are people in here. My heart is racing. I'm terrified. I'm helpless. They scream at me and each other. Violent threats, laughter, snickering. You sound like Warnet. No balls. Brandy. Bitch. Wise Link. Dent your face. They sound like me. Am I screaming? Wiseling tells me to stop screaming. It's annoying the neighbors. Got em! Lafty tafty assholes. It's annoying her too. She says there aren't any neighbors. The apartment is empty. Dumbass. I don't believe her. They're loud. She wants me out. I don't appreciate it. Look at the hole. I live there. People in there. They stand by my bed. I reach to touch them. They aren't there. Journal Entry 9 I found my phone. The neighbors had it. They took pictures. Brandy's body twisted in unfathomable directions at the bottom of some stairs. Smiles, swipe left. Wiseling's face is blue. The cat licked crusted food off her face. Her toothless mouth hung open. Her teeth were in her lap. Giggle, swipe left. Warned's face is burned. A steering wheel is jammed into his abdomen. He looks surprised. Ta da! Laugh. Phone shuts off. Shadows surround them. Shadows surround me. The voices laugh. The voices scream. No sleep. No dreams. The building is shaking. The neighbors are in the hole. I'm burning up. Nope! I'm cold again. They're laughing again. I'm laughing with them. <laughs> the rest of the pages were unintelligible. Whoever wrote the journal tried to continue. His writing turned to scribbles and the pages were stained with black smudges. My dizziness from earlier had passed around entry five. There was no way to stop reading it. Three hours had passed. Everyone else from the auction was already gone, leaving me in the eerie silence of the storage building. It was time to head home, too. A conversation with my wife over the phone made the ride go quick. I needed someone to talk to. I didn't want to think about the madness between those pages of the journal. We talked about the stuff inside unit number 25, save for the journal and its insane ramblings. My wife spooks pretty easy when it comes to stuff like that. She'd feel uneasy keeping the belongings inside our house. Well, what she doesn't know won't hurt her. When I arrived home, I found my wife in the kitchen preparing our dinner. For the past 20 years, when I got home, the first thing I did was find my wife and give her a kiss. In 20 years, she never rejected me. She was always happy to see me, always wanted to kiss and hug and touch. Walking into the kitchen to say hello, she turned in my direction and a frown stretched across her lips. I thought nothing of it until she turned her face away from me in disgust. 
She brought her hand to her nose and pushed me away from her, complaining that I smelled like rancid milk. And so, dear listeners, with our tales told, the time has come for us to leave you. Hopefully to a pleasant evening, free of any of life's little irritations. And although it may be sweet sorrow for us to part, fear not, for we are always close by, watching, listening. But until we speak again, let us simply say that you'll be hearing from us soon, next time on The Signal. Hi everybody, me again, and I really hope you enjoyed our show today. Please take a moment to thank those that made today's show possible, including our newest narrator, Damien Gerard, who provided the voice for Stephen Jackson's It's a Guy Thing. Music for this episode was partly created by myself, but the far larger part we owe to Kevin McLeod, whose brilliant work is available at Incompetech.com. That's spelled I-N-C-O-M-P-E-T-E-C-H dot com. Again, we are accepting story submissions at Signal Horror Fiction, all one word, on Reddit, and financial donations for our very cool rewards can be made at patreon.com slash signalobscura. As always, I hope you've had a good time, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Remember to like, subscribe, rate, and share us wherever possible. After all, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs>